Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and welcome to the first video in what I'm going to call the Atoms and Sporks Journal Club. The idea here is that I'm going to arbitrarily, from time to time, pick out a recent physics paper and we'll talk about it. And I do stress arbitrarily chosen. The reality is that tons of amazing papers come out literally every day, and I'm just going to do this once in a while. So just because I choose a certain paper, it doesn't mean in any way that it's the best physics paper that's come out, or it's the most important, or better than any other paper I don't cover. It literally just means I went, yeah, okay, that's kind of interesting. Let's do that one. That'll be the entire process. But okay, today I want to talk about this paper, which appeared in the journal Light, Science and Applications, which is a very high impact journal, back in August. And it's called Single Shot Real Time femtosecond imaging of temporal focusing. So what's it about? Well, in a nutshell, it's about the development of a camera system that is so fast, it can literally capture events faster than the speed of light. What do I mean by that? Well, just look at this. That was real footage of a light pulse bouncing off a mirror. Here's another one of light going through a beam splitter. I don't know about you, but I think that is freaking amazing. And those are both from this paper, and there are actually more videos, which you can find in the supplementary materials section of the paper, which I've linked below. But okay, let's talk about this. They call this camera system TCUP, which stands for Trillion Frame Per Second Compressed Ultra Fast Photography. But how is this possible? How can they make this TCUP camera that records so fast it can literally film things traveling at the speed of light? Well, before we get into that, let's get a little abstract for a moment and ask ourselves what a camera is actually doing. When I'm filming something, I can imagine a little viewport where I'm watching my scene play out, and I can think of applying sort of a coordinate system to my viewport, giving each and every point an X and Y coordinate. And on top of this, the scene I'm filming takes place over a certain interval of time. Let's say for the sake of nice round numbers, it happens over a nanosecond, which is a billionth of a second. So really, for every point X and Y within my viewport, there's unique information I want to collect between some initial time to some final time. In fancy language, we say that there is an abstract data volume of information that I can label with three coordinates, X, Y, and T, and when I'm filming something, what I'm trying to do is to collect the best approximation I can of all that information. If we put on our abstract thinking hats, that's really what filming a scene is. It's sampling an XYT data volume. And I do mean collect the best approximation of this data volume. In reality, there is some data at every possible continuous value of X, Y, and T, and there is thus an infinite amount of information to collect, which obviously isn't what we do. So take, for example, a regular camera, and imagine we take a picture of the scene. Now let me reiterate, let's imagine we take a single picture, not a movie. Well, the way we do this is by capturing the entire scene in a single so-called exposure. The shutter of the camera opens up and stays open the entire nanosecond, and all that transpires in the interval of time is basically averaged over, and we get a blurry image, maybe like this. Now let's put our abstract thinking ads back on and think about what has happened here. Basically, the entire time axis of the data volume has been averaged over. In fancy talk, we say that the final image has been fully temporally integrated, which means we took an average along the entirety of the time coordinate. However, this temporal integration wasn't the only integrating or averaging we did. A digital camera doesn't collect an infinitely precise continuum of XY data within its viewport. Instead, it only has a finite number of pixels in the X and Y direction, and it's basically spatially integrating over a small neighborhood around each pixel. So a single exposure image of a scene samples our hypothetical data volume by fully integrating over the time coordinate and then taking a finite number of XY points, which are our pixels, and integrating in some neighborhood around them. That's the strategy it takes. Hopefully that makes sense to you. If you're lost, I'd maybe take the time to go back because understanding what is happening with this integration is super important in understanding how this teacup camera works. 
But okay, so that's how taking a single image approximates things. And of course, taking a single image is a terrible way to capture a movie scene. Instead, we generally use a video camera and take a video. In a video, what you do is you take many single exposures, each called a frame, and try to basically repeat the process over and over again as fast as possible. Say we have a camera that films at 3 frames per nanosecond, which is a super fast camera, but let's just say we do. What that means is that when it comes to our time axis, it's subdividing it into three slices, and then it's doing the same spatial and temporal integration as before. So rather than a full temporal integration, it's doing three partial temporal integrations in the neighborhood of three points in time. So that's really what a camera does. If I have, say, a camera that has a viewport made of five pixels by four pixels, and it takes three frames per nanosecond, then I am approximating my scene by sampling five times four times three, which is 60, data points that represent spatial and temporal integrations in some neighborhood around those points. Okay, so how does the teacup camera work? Well, what it's definitely not doing is creating a trillion single exposure images in a second. And I know, I know, it's literally in the name and everything, but that's simply not even close to possible. Rather, it's actually only taking a single exposure, just a single frame, and yet they have the gall to claim to be a trillion FPS camera. How is this possible? Well, first we need to understand what's going on with the C in teacup, which stands for compressed. This is referring to what is called a compressed sensing algorithm. In a nutshell, at the heart of this camera is a computer algorithm that, when given only sparse sporadic data points from this data volume, can use some very clever math to sleuth out like a detective what probabilistically was the most likely form of the entire data volume. A big part of what makes this possible is that teacup only works for filming so-called sparse scenes. Like if you look at this video, at any given moment, most of the pixels aren't really carrying any useful information we care about. We can ignore them. The actual useful information only makes up a sparse sub-volume of the total volume. So, okay, it's reconstructing the image from a sampling of points, but in order for this to work well, the points fed into the algorithm have to be fairly representative. And that's really the second big bit of cleverness in the work, the scheme they came up with to tease a sufficient amount of the right kind of data out of the data volume for the compressed sensing algorithm to work. Now, obviously, the big issue here, because it's all only a single exposure, is the time axis. In a single exposure, if you remember, all detailed time information is just blurred together. So how did they get around that? Well, they used two cameras. The light from the scene was passed through a beam splitter, so that basically two cameras were taking a single combined exposure of the same scene. Now, the first camera was just taking a conventional image, just like we talked about. It took an image that was fully temporally integrated, and then spatially integrated about the neighborhood of each pixel. However, the second camera was a different kind of camera entirely. It was what is called a streak camera. Basically, this camera has a viewport that is a fair bit wider than the viewport for the scene, and then basically a fancy kind of mirror. And what this mirror does is it continuously redirects the light from the scene along the streak camera's pixels. This creates what is called a time sheared image. Information about what is happening along the time direction has been blurred and mixed into the X direction of the streak camera image. So then, can you combine the regular temporally integrated image with the time sheared street camera image and reconstruct the scene? Almost, but not quite. It turns out that's not enough for the compressed sensing algorithm. And you can probably see why this time sheared image is super hard to interpret as it blurs together motion and time with motion and space. To help with things, the final piece of the puzzle is that before light hits the street camera, it is spatially encoded, which is fancy talk for it passes through a digital micrometer device, or DMD, that basically overlays a pattern onto the light before it is time sheared. The key thing though is that this pattern that gets superimposed is known. And because it is known, it applies a certain amount of, I guess you could say, tagging or labeling to the image in terms of what light is coming from what place in space. And as the time sheared image gets generated, the fact that you've left this spatial fingerprint on the image helps you tease out what is spatial information and what is temporal. 
And that's it. That's how the teacup camera works. It takes a single exposure, the light of which is split into two. One branch goes to a conventional camera that takes a temporally integrated image, and the other first passes through a spatial encoder, which leaves a known fingerprint on the lights, and then is swept across a street camera in real time to produce a time-sheared image. Given those two pictures, the time-sheared and temporally integrated one, plus knowledge of the spatial encoding, the compressed sensing algorithm has all it needs to do its Sherlock Holmes thing. And voila. Anyways, I thought that paper was really cool. Hopefully you have some appreciation now for it too. Hopefully you like the idea of an Adams and Sports Journal Club and hope to see you around. Have a good one.